All right, good morning. Really cool to have you all here. Um, Travis is going to give his class presentation right now for a very good reason. He didn't give it with a normal thing. So without further ado, Travis, take the stage. Man. All right, good morning, everybody. Um, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about elementary particles. And <clears throat> the idea of elementary particles is really just is the building blocks of matter and everything in the universe. And scientists have been kind of trying to figure this out for quite a long time. Um, we talked a little bit, or Dr. Russell talked a little bit about some of this stuff in Chem 221 and 222, so I'm going to do a quick overview of them. Uh, back in the day, Aristotle and the Greek philosophers they predicted that everything was made of earth, air, fire, and water. And he has a little periodic table that someone's mapped up for it. And uh, that was pretty good based on that fact all he had was his hands and his eyes to figure this out. Uh, but it wasn't quite correct. And as time went on, scientists uh, developed more um, detection software, or not software, hardware and whatnot, uh, tools to figure out more things. Thompson over here decided that the atom was made up of something that looked, resembled like a plum pudding, which was really just like a positively charged mass with little pockets of electrons in there as well. That also wasn't quite correct, but it was pretty good for this time. Each of these kind of had a um, different uh, bound, a different level of understanding as time went on. Uh, Dalton said that uh, each atom is broken down into like a solid sphere of things, so kind of if you split every um, any element down to its small size, you can get to a smallest like sphere of mass. And again, that's not quite correct. Bohr's theory of the atom was pretty good, but it wasn't still quite correct as we have it. With his electron flows were just orbitals instead of these crazy little um, sp orbitals and stuff like that we have today. But all of these guys were working with what they had, and as technology progressed, they do uh, their understanding of things got a lot better as well. I have a little video to show, kind of demonstrating that, but Dr. Oh my, there's a frog on a bump on this log that I found in a hole in the bottom of the sea. And that's the ultimate secret of the universe? Apparently so. Wait, there's a snail on the tail of a frog on the bump on this log that I found in a hole in the bottom of the sea. Dear Liza! The snail itself is composed of cells, molecules, atoms. Those things don't rhyme. Things only rhyme below 10 to the minus 5 angstroms, you dope. Now, ions and pions, muons and gluons, neutrinos, gravitinos, we're closing in on the very smallest particles of matter. For the first time, we are about to observe the fundamental structure of the universe. <laughs> such detail, such finely wrought, intricate beauty. It's like staring into the face of God. It's a mirror in discovery, so... <clears throat> So you can see that we're just trying to find that smallest little building block thing and it might end up being a tiny little dot that doesn't really mean much to most many people. But it's still really cool to a few people who actually kind of pay attention to these things, particle physicists and other things. Um, so to get into some of the history on how all of this stuff was created, we'll start with uh, the electron. <clears throat> and the electron was first discovered by J.J. Thompson using this cathode ray tube here. It's basically an electron gun that fires electrons down the center of it. And they didn't really know what was happening here when they first started out here. J.J. Thompson was able to create basically a capacitor across the middle, and he was able to then deflect the electron up or downwards depending on the charge of that capacitor. Because um, electrons would be attracted towards the positive side of that capacitor. Uh, by doing this, he was able to prove that the electron itself was a particle in itself, and it was negatively charged. Uh, it was Robert Millikan that, with his oil drop experiment here, there, that was uh, able to determine the uh, charge to mass ratio of the electron itself. And the electron is actually the first fundamental particle ever discovered, and that was back in 1897 that they figured this out. Now, <coughs> going forward, uh, Ernest Rutherford, with his gold foil experiment, figured out that uh, protons were in the, in the center of an atom. What he did was he bombarded a gold foil with uh, an alpha particle which most of the time just passed straight through, but every now and then it was slightly deflected and sometimes even bounced back on itself. And he determined that there must be a, most of the mass of the atom is in the center of the atom and a very small part of it where most of the atom is actually pretty much empty. And then he determined it had to be positively charged, thus uh, kind of proving the existence of protons there. Um, and then James Chadwick came a few years after that, about 20 years after that, with his uh, neutron chamber, basically taking alpha particles again and bombarding beryllium 
to create an unknown form of radiation, which they eventually found out was a mixture of protons, which are positively charged, and a, a neutron, which has basically the same mass but a neutral charge to it. <clears throat> For a long time, these were thought to be the fundamental particles, neutrons, protons, and electrons. And for the sake of this class, they pretty much are. Uh, we don't go too much into detail besides the nuclear chemistry beyond all of that, but there's a lot more that's in, in beyond that. You know, we found out later that protons and neutrons are not actually fundamental particles, only the electron here is. So if we go a little bit further, we get to cosmic rays. Now, I love cosmic rays. I think they're horribly fascinating. Basically, uh, Carl David Anderson was one of the pioneers of the cosmic ray and the cloud chamber in 1932. And what he did is he took this chamber here and it has a piston over here. When he raises the piston up, it expands the volume of that, which lowers the temperature, creating a vapor inside of that chamber, a little cloud inside of the chamber. And when they would notice that there would be ionized pathways in that cloud sporadically. And what they figured is there's a charged particle flying through there that we can't see. And for a long time, they thought, well, this is cool, but we don't know much about it. He was the one, Carl David Anderson, he put a magnetic field through there, and when a charged particle travels through a magnetic field, it spins. And based on the radius of that spin, they're able to determine the mass of the charged particle. In the direction of the spin, they were able to determine the charge of the particle. So <clears throat> he was able to determine that he found a particle that had the same mass as an electron, but the opposite charge. And we call that the positron. This was the first instance of antimatter being discovered, which was really cool because for every particle of matter, there's an equivalent particle of antimatter somewhere in the universe, basically. And this has been theorized, but he was the first one to actually detect something like that. And a little bit later, he detected another particle about 200 times the size of an electron, but still smaller than a proton, and that was the muon. And these two were also somewhat of fundamental particles. And shortly after that, the hype of the cloud chambers started coming. Scientists were building cloud chambers out of everything, detecting new particles almost every day, going up in hot air balloons and stuff like that so they can get higher up into the atmosphere. So what happens is uh, some cosmic ray is basically a proton that's accelerated at really high speeds, and it hits our atmosphere. When it collides with a particle in our atmosphere, it splits up into all these different uh, particles that we can see here, you can see like a shower of things. And they break up and interact with things as they go farther down. So the higher up in the atmosphere you get, the more particles you start to detect. Um, and you can see, oops, wrong button. They started finding all different types of particles. These are just a few of them. There's actually a couple hundred different particles they found. And they thought to themselves, these all can't be fundamental particles. There has to be something somewhat smaller than that. So we, they broke it down and started categorizing it. They called this the particle zoo, because there's basically a zoo with all these different animals in there, and we don't know which ones are actually the original animals to it. Eventually, they were able to categorize these into a couple different things. You have the hadrons, which are on this side over here. Uh, those are gonna be composite particles, things that are actually made up of smaller particles yet. And then the leptons over on this side, these are the ones that are actually fundamental particles. And I kind of filled in with a few other ones, besides the electron and the mu, we have the tau, and then each of those has a corresponding neutrino, and then there's the antimatter equivalent for all of those there. These hadrons over here, like I said, they're actually made up of different particles as well. The protons and neutrons are part of those. So they're made up of smaller particles in there. And it wasn't until 1964 that Murray Gell-Mann and Yuval Neumann, if I pronounced that correctly, developed a way called to figure out what these must be made out of, which is called the eightfold way. They basically categorize things based on their spin. You see, they have a spin of zero in this chart, spin of one, spin of one half, and spin of three halves. So anything with an integer of or one, basically, has a, what they call mesons. And things with spins of an integer of one half or so, they call baryons. And as they started classifying these, they broke it up based on a few different categories. Their charge, which is the Q, these blue lines follow that charge. And then the red is what they call the strangeness factor. They weren't sure what that was, but they were able to tell there's some of the trait and the difference. And as they did that, they eventually figured out um, that all of these can be de uh, described using three new particles, what they call quarks. And, well, not that quark, get him out of here. Um, these quarks down here. Basically, the up, down, and strange quark compose all the different uh, atoms, or all the different particles that we saw earlier. Um, they're consisted of baryons have three different quarks inside of them, like here, and mesons have two different quarks inside of them, mainly a quark and an anti-quark. 
And based on these configurations, you can get all the different particles we were seeing before. For example, you see the charges of the different uh, flavors of quarks. The up has a positive two-thirds charge. The down and the strange both have a negative one-third charge. So if we combine these together with like an up, up, and a down, we get a proton with a positive one charge. The same, similar is true with a neutron, up, down, and down, gives us a neutral charge here. And you see the neutron and the proton are up there with the strange of zero and a charge of one and zero. So we were able to then explain all the different particles we knew. But based on these, we were also able to determine a new particle, which is Murray Gell-Mann over there, decided that there must be another particle based on the existence of all these up on the top. He basically triangulated these down and predicted this omega particle down at the bottom, which wasn't actually confirmed until about, I think, three or four years later, they actually found that omega particle, which verified the whole quark model in general. Years later, the charm, the top, and the bottom quarks also got added to those, have similar properties in different ways, two -third, plus two-third charge for the top and the charm, and a minus one-third charge for the bottom as well. So with the quarks in mind and the leptons we saw earlier, that is all the matter particles that we know in the universe. But there's one more type of particle we have to talk about, and that's the bosons. They're basically force-carrying particles. They're what uh, chain or they what, that's what allows one particle to act on another particle, to have a force between them. And the first of those is basically the photons. Um, described by Albert Einstein in his photoelectric effect on how light can travel as waves and also as particles. And <clears throat> basically, if an uh, electron is flying through space and it hits a photon, this little green squiggly line here is your photon, the electron can change position and it'll act as a force on that electron and so on. These are down here called Feynman diagrams. They kind of, what they use to define uh, and describe the forces interacting between particles. Um, in the, the 70s, they figured out the gluons, which are the strong force carriers. So there's different forces in the universe. There's photonic forces, strong forces, weak forces, and uh, gravity, which gravity is actually not included in this whole thing, so it's yet to be determined. But the gluons here are uh, the force carriers for the strong force. And they basically hold the quarks together inside the atom. They also hold the protons and neutrons together inside the nucleus as well. Um, when you break those apart, a huge amount of energy is released, stuff like a nuclear blast, when you split open a hydrogen bomb or something like that. And um, if you try to separate out these quarks, it releases a huge amount of energy and actually creates more quarks. So we can't actually isolate one quark from each other. Yeah, it always has to come in pairs, basically. The electroweak force was figured out in 1983, and that's basically what makes uh, radiation happen. Your beta decay and your um, alpha particles, beta particles, and stuff like that, it's all because of a release of the weak force, basically. And there's two different, or three different particles. There's a W plus, W minus, and a Z particle that all kind of interact with those. And you can get, kind of see an example of that down here, where there's a neutron, it releases the, through the weak force, becomes a proton, and emits an electron and an electron neutrino, or an anti-electron neutrino. Kind of an example of how the weak force works. Uh, the Higgs boson was predicted in 1964 by Peter Higgs, and this was a revolu revolutionary idea because it was the idea that um, there's basically a Higgs field that helps create the, uh, a lot of these other forces and uh, allow those to actually work like they were supposed to work. He unified the electronic or the electroweak force and um, was it the electromagnetic force and the weak force together into an electroweak force theory, um, but they actually built the Large Hadron Collider in Europe specifically to find the Higgs boson. It's been 50 years and billions of dollars to build this, and in 2012 they were able to discover the, that his prediction was true. So it took over 50 years and a bunch of money and a bunch of brains working on it, and. <clears throat> he got the little Nobel Prize in, I think, 2013 or 14 for that one. And with the bosons, we have all the different uh, subatomic or fundamental particles there. That we've seen. And these are the list of all of them. Again, you have quarks up on the top, you have quarks, anti-quarks, and then all the leptons and anti-leptons, and then the bosons sort of on this side here. And what's left out of here is, again, gravity. There's an idea that there could be uh, a gravitron as well that would fit somewhere over here with the force of gravity interacting. But gravity is a very weak force, so it's very hard to detect. So that's somewhere in the future of particle physics, hopefully. And that's all I have. Thank you.
Any questions for Charlie? continue on now with uh, regular scheduled programming and stuff like that. That will include talking here about coordination compounds, which is the last big focus of our stuff in lecture. And towards the end today, I will be returning your midterms. So we'll talk about that when we get to that part. So, uh, this uh, type of system right here is a way to describe ligands around metals. And ligand is maybe a new term for some of you. A ligand really is nothing more than a Lewis base. And like we talked about this quarter, a Lewis base is something with a lone pair of electrons. Those electrons can be donated to a Lewis acid, something that can accept the electrons. And in this chapter, the Lewis acid will always be a metal center. So when it comes to these ligands, these Lewis bases, most of the ones we've seen so far have been what they call monodentate. Dentate means teeth, and you can literally think about the teeth as being something that connects to the metal. So the monodentate ligands would be the normal kinds of Lewis bases. So cyanide, CN minus, lots of bone pairs. Um, chloride would be a good example. Water, hydroxide, anything with a lone pair. But all of these examples have been pretty small. And what we're gonna do here in a little bit is talk about some ligands with more than one tooth. And that means more than one place to connect to the metal center, all right? You can imagine if the ligand is big enough you could have like two places to connect if you had like lots of carbons or something like that. So when you hear bidentate or tetradentate, the re prefix is just referring to the number of places that can connect. Um, some of them are just polydentate, which means two or more places to connect. And if you're about chelating agents, that's really nothing more than a type of a ligand with more than one connection to the metal center. And I'll show you some examples. Monodentates are very common and usually pretty easy to see. And these examples right here are all monodentate. And so again, what that means is they have one place that they can connect to a metal center. All of these have lone pairs on them. So if you drew out a Lewis structure, you'd see at least one lone pair, sometimes two, but they're also relatively small. So they'll make one connection. Um, water, cyanide, like I said earlier, ammonia, here's nitrite, all right, biocyanide we used in lab at the beginning of this quarter, um, all the halides, CO, etc. So monodentates, uh, again, go around that metal center. Again, it's these, the ligands are the Lewis bases and the metal will be the Lewis acids. So cobalt with six ammonias and iron with six thiocyanides, both of these have six monodentate ligands. It would be six thiocyanides here, it would be six ammonias. Um, a lot of the metals like to form octahedral complexes, so six is a number we'll see a lot. Some of them are four and some of them are two, but a lot of them um, are six. Now, <clears throat> the more interesting things and the newer ones now are the ones that have two teeth connections to the metal. So these are all gonna be bigger atoms, all right, molecules, excuse me, more atoms to them, and they're gonna have two places to attack, if you will. Um, the, my favorite one of all of these is a compound called ethylene diamine. Now, ethylene in organic chemistry was a two-carbon system. And in organic chemistry, an amine is something with a nitrogen on it. So ethylene, two carbons, diamine, two nitrogens. You can see how this thing has nitrogens on the end and carbons in the middle. So 
Hunter, if I can use you one more time. I've shook hands with Hunter so many times, this time it's embarrassing. This would be a monodentate connection, all right? But if I'm big enough, all right, I can come around here and I can make another connection with him like right there. It's what these guys are doing. Thank you, Hunter. Monobidentates have like two places to connect to the center, all right? So normally with Hunter and I are doing our bonding thing and stuff, it's just a single handshake that works really well, all right? But these guys are actually big enough, they swear Round hunter. <laughs> uh, anyway, I get too excited here. Anyway, they, they're bigger, all right, so they can make two connections to that central atom. Um, oxalate is one you hear about sometimes with vegetables. That's a bigger one too. It's got four oxygens like around the carbons. And so two of the outside oxygens can also connect to the metal. And this crazy thing, ortho is a way to describe uh, come, uh, pieces on a benzene ring. Ofen, as it's called, is another example of a bidentate ligand. So if you have a bidentate ligand, all right, that bidentate is going to take up two available spots. So all of these examples are six coordinate, which means they can have six Lewis base connections. But unlike the last examples now, like this one only has three of these ethylene diamines. That's because each one of these has two connections, those two nitrogens on the end. So if, if this cobalt wants six things around it, it only needs three ethylene diamines. And the same for oxalate. Ofen is a huge molecule. I'll show you a picture in a little bit. So it actually is pretty big. It would be harder to get three of them around. Not impossible, but harder. So this has just one bidentate and four monodentate ligands. Um, here's the actual Lewis structures of these different things. And again, I'm trying to focus here on where the connections are, where those teeth are. And again, that's going to be someplace with a Lewis uh, or a lone pair of electrons. So the ethylene diamine, definitely on the nitrogens. This crazy thing resonates like crazy, like you could have a double bond up here or a double bond up there. But when it binds to the metal, it's usually the oxygens that are adjacent, same side, cis, if you remember the organic chemistry thing. So that would be the two teeth. And this crazy thing, orthophenanthrolene, all right, the two connections are also on the nitrogen. Nitrogen's a great place for a base. And again, you do not have to memorize any of this or anything, but if you remember hearing about ethylene diamine, which gets the symbol EN, or orthophenanthrolene, which is OFEN, uh, you can remember back that, ha, maybe it's got more than one place to connect. This is a uh, structure of one of the complex ions with cobalt, and it has three ethylene diamines. Um, Here's a new type of way of describing molecules we haven't seen, but you might see if you go into biochemistry one day. Sometimes it's called the ribbon system. And instead of listing like all the individual carbons and blah, 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 they use this ribbon idea just to show that something's connecting it. So just like in OCHEM, we sometimes use the line diagrams to show where the carbons were, but we didn't show the hydrogens at all because they aren't that important. This is another level when you get to bigger and bigger structures. It shows what the overall geometry is, but it doesn't give all of the details. But as the hip scientist, you can absolutely go back. But anyway, each one of the blue atoms then, in this case, is a nitrogen. There would be a CH2CH2 in the ribbon part, so you can see then how they all coordinate. Um, here's an, uh, one example I could find of a triofen. So each one of these uh, orthophenanthrolene things and stuff like that is connected to an iron. And you can see that it's just a bizarre structure, but like there's one right there, there's one right here, and there's one right there. And they kind of rotate them around the molecule just so you can see it easier. <coughs> um, the pretty pretty big molecule compared to the things we've been looking at. As you start getting more now into biochemistry, the molecules will get bigger and bigger and bigger. So. 
In lab this last week, you did use a compound called DMG, that's the abbreviation, which stands for dimethylglyoxine. And it's a really cool chemical for the detection of nickel, all right? So when you made the compound to confirm nickel, at least in your known, what happens is two dimethylglyoxines surround the nickel. So nickel here is surrounded by two bidentate DMGs, and you see it's bidentate because this is, these are the connections, these are the teeth to the nickel. So dimethylglyoxine has two nitrogens with lone pairs connecting to them. When it forms, it makes that kind of a red compound and stuff. Now, this molecule is also showing some weird kind of bondings over there. Anyone have any ideas what that kind of bonding might represent? Hydrogen bonding, well done. Hydrogen bonding is something we talked about in Chem 222. If you have a hydrogen connected to oxygen, fluorine, or nitrogen, uh, you can make this hydrogen bond, which is oftentimes like a dashed line. It's a pretty strong line. It keeps our DNA together, all that kind of stuff. So this, this one and this one would be nothing more than a hydrogen bonding between the glyoxine molecules. Well, these right here are the actual Lewis base, Lewis acid thing. So here's a question. Ethylene glycol, all right, which is a diol, a double alcohol, all right? Ethylene glycol is shown there. What would you describe its dentate character, i.e., uh, does it, first of all, does it have any teeth? And if it has like one tooth mono, two teeth, five, three tri, et cetera, et cetera. And what do we use to like qualify if something has teeth or not? Lone pairs. Lone pairs, that's exactly it. This thing would have uh, lone, pa lone pairs is what you're looking for for the teeth. And you can see on this molecule, there's a lone pair set right there and a lone pair set right there. And just like the ethylene diamine in the example we looked at even earlier, which had carbons in the middle and nitrogens right there, just like ethylene diamine, this thing can also connect at two different places. Each of those oxygens potentially can connect to a central atom. Yeah. One person has been able to do it, but why is everybody not able to do it? I think everybody pushed out. It is the end of it. So, uh, hold on. I, I'm seeing a good kind of thing here, so let me kick out of that. Let me try again. If you're the one person that's able to vote, you don't have to raise it. Try it now. Sorry about this. Good. Now I'm seeing lots of things. All right. So sorry. I'm, I don't know what happened there, but we'll we'll go with it. All right. So bidentate two teeth punch the punch line. Look for the lone pairs. If they're far enough apart, which this time they are, then in theory they could make like two teeth connections. Bidentate. Any questions? All right. The most, uh, arguably the most important of all the ligands known, though, is something called EDTA. And in biology, this is used quite a bit. And EDTA is a polydentate ligand. So poly means many. There's many different teeth on this molecule. Um, <clears throat> EDTA is a great metal scavenger. So if you get metal in some kind of sample and you don't want the metal there, EDTA is really good at removing most metals, except it doesn't do a very good job with group 1A. So sodium, lithium, potassium, not a lot of help there, but it does a great job, say, like removing mercury or chromium and stuff like that. When it surrounds the metal, it ends up making very stable and water-soluble complexes. So if you can then get this out of the solution, it's a great way for pulling it out, especially if you don't want it there. Um, the formation constants, which are the ways, the equilibrium constants to describe the EDTA metal complex, very, very high. And so that means very, very product-favored. So these things, when they come together, they want to form. 
Um, this is something I just want to introduce. If you see something called a primary standard, it means you can use it like right out of the bottle. All right, you don't have to do a test for it to see how pure it is. You don't have to heat it up necessarily. Um, primary standard can be pretty cool for chemistry because you don't have to purify it and stuff. But by far my favorite use of all was from the movie Blade. What's all this? To the hospital last night, bought some equipment. For your miracle cure. This is EDTA. It's an anticoagulant. We use it to treat blood clots. And look what happens when I introduce it onto a sample of vampire blood. Take a step back. The reaction is energetic. EDTA was a cure, but maybe you could use it to explode some vampire heads. Okay, so I apologize again for the bad movie references, but Blade, in the movie, he was a person that was going after the vampires, all right? And EDTA was actually a kind of a cool twist on this. They were using EDTA that attacked the vampire blood and made it blow up and stuff like that. And this is the first one and stuff like that. And of course, it's one of my favorite movies, so I had to put it in. My apologies again for bad stuff. EDTA, though, is a real material, so if you do watch my bad movie recommendations, yes, science! Anyway, this is what EDTA really looks like. It does not make blood, as far as I know, vampire blood is <laughs> explode, I don't know. But anyway, this is a large molecule. But remember how earlier when I kind of surrounded Hunter with my hands, all right? This thing has all kinds of hands on it. And sometimes it uses all of the hands, and sometimes it uses just some of the hands. Now, the full name of EDTA is ethylene diamine tetraacetic acid. So the ethylene part is these two carbons in the middle. Diamine means it's got a nitrogen on the end. So that ethylene diamine we saw earlier was basically this part with just hydrogens right there. However, you can extract those hydrogens and put essentially an acetic acid part on it. So acetic acid is CH3, C double bond O, OH. So the one hydrogen is removed to connect to the nitrogen. This is the negative uh, ion form because each of the acidic hydrogens here has been removed, all right? There should be like a lone pair right there. Um, the important part here is that every one of these red spots is a potential place that can connect to a metal. So if the metal has six connection spots, all six of these activates surrounding the metal and that's what makes it pulled out of solution, stuff like that. Um, EDTA is pretty easy to use, and again, in the right context, it can be pretty powerful. This is a, com uh, this is a combination of a compound uh, so where EDTA is surrounding a cobalt, all right? And again, you can see as the number of atoms gets larger, this ribbon theory is kind of cool. Um, the middle part of EDTA is the nitrogen-nitrogen connection, and then each nitrogen has two uh, acetic acid, essentially, parts where there's an oxygen connecting. So the EDTA here is being surrounded and stuff by all six pieces. Now if EDTA, like on that last example, has really a negative four charge, what do you think the cobalt charge is gonna be here, knowing that overall it's negative one? Plus three, that's right. So if EDTA is negative four, and the whole molecule is negative one, this is a cobalt three ion, all right? So this cobalt three is being surrounded by the EDTA. Um, these are the log of equilibrium constants, all right? Now, to get the actual equilibrium constant, you would go 10 to the power of 15.4. So these Ks are just massively large, like a lot of the formation constants we've seen. And I put it up here not to, you know, have something to know, but um, notice how all of these metals, very, very product favored equilibrium constants. So if EDA sees K, Cadmium, it's all over it, right? It's going to just totally surround it and stuff and pull it out. So again, if you have a metal in your system, this is where EDTA can be really, really handy. Um, 
porphine is another one stuff that's in nature. And again, to figure out how many connection spots it has, you look for the lone pairs. Nitrogen always has a lone pair as well. So you can see here that the nitrogens, uh, both of them are being connected. Um, myoglobin, which is used in our bodies, it's one of the oxygen kind of things. It definitely has it and stuff. So again, the iron is the metal. You can see there's the little O2. And then here's this little nitrogen on this ring connecting to it. And again, the molecules are getting bigger now. We're seeing biochemical molecules, which is a cool class to take after Chem 223. Uh, these molecules are just huge to me. Uh, here's more oxyglobin. Uh, here's the iron again. The oxygen is transported to our bodies, basically using this. But again, those other spots around the iron do have different kinds of ligands surrounding them. Cool. Now, the real reason we're talking about this, though, is to get to this uh, section right here. And I want you to know how to name these compounds. And at first, when you see these names, they're kind of wild, all right? So I want to talk about how you can take one of these names and break it down into a formula. Or, of course, if you had the formula, you could then create a name out of it. Now, these rules are pretty boring. If you name something in chemistry, it's always the positive part followed by the negative part. So cation before anion, or in Chem 222, we saw that the least electronegative was in the middle and the more electronegative was on the outside, which is another way of saying basically more positive first and negative last. Um, but there's some other things here about these guys. So first of all, if you have a metal in the anion, it's going to get a different name. A different name, sorry. It's going to be called an ATE. So for example, zinc, if it was in the negative part, you wouldn't call it zinc. It would be zinc 8. And you would have chromate and all kinds of things like that. And I'll show you examples of what this means. All of these kinds of compounds are going to have multiple ligands by them. And again, like everything in chemistry, you want to alphabetize if possible, all right? Um, if you use multiple ligands, then you'll use bi and tri and those kind of things that we've seen already. Um, the metal is always named last. And you do put the charge, which is what the oxidation state means, next to the metal. And again, I'll show you examples of this here in a little bit. There's no spaces in the complex name. And this is what makes for some really wild looking names. But again, like I said, if you break it down, these are totally understandable. And actually, I think, easier than some of the things we saw in organic chemistry. Um, there is a handout relating to all of this. It's called the Coordination Compounds Handout. And again, there's going to be a couple questions on this in problem set six. I think there's two questions on the take home quiz six. I don't think any of these are going to be real hard <coughs> questions, but these things will help you to kind of get ready for what's going on. Okay, so. <clears throat> When you're naming the ligands, all right, most of them are pretty standard, but like with every field, there's always got to be those little weird kind of things. So if you see like water, you don't call it like dye water. You would go dye aqua. Aqua has always been the name for water when it's a ligand. And I, I don't know where these names started from, but just be aware that that's what you see. Um, another weird one, ammonia is called amine. And notice the double M. An amine with one M is an organic chemistry family that we talked about where there was a nitrogen and it had a carbon or something next to it, like we saw earlier, ethyl, ethyl amine, diamine, all right? Two M's means it's an ammonia connected to the metal. And that's really weird, and I hate that rule, I'll be honest, but I am just the messenger. So realize if you see ammonia, you don't call it ammonia, and it's an amine with two M's. And that two M is really important for chemistry. Um, another one I don't like, honestly, is let me tell you all my stories. Anyway, another one that's not my favorite. Carbon monoxide is called carbonyl. And if you remember from organic chemistry, a carbonyl was a C double bond O in an organic compound. So a carbonyl in this stuff means it's a ligand around a metal. It's not just that. And hydroxide is called hydroxo, and that's totally fine. 
and use, oh yes, 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 some of the uh, Greek, some of the ligand names will have Greek prefixes in them, and there's an alternative way of talking about those, and I call it bis, tris, tetrakis. So if you have two, you'll use bis, and three will be tris, and et cetera, et cetera. I'll tell you what this means here in a little bit. This is an example of when you'd want to use this system. Ethylene diamine is one of the ligands we saw earlier. Ethylene diamine has a di, so it already has a Greek prefix. So if your ligand has a Greek prefix already, then you wouldn't want to call it bisethylene, or, or excuse me, diethylene diamine. The chemist might think it was two ethylenes, two amines. So instead they use bis for, do, for two, this ethylene diamine then tells the scientist that you've got a ligand with a Greek prefix. We need to use this alternative system. But again, bis means two, tris means three, etc. And I'm going to show you some examples. So without further ado, before we get done here, let's look at some of these. This is an example of a complex ion. It has six waters around it. It's a cobalt center with a positive two charge. Now, we're going to be naming water in this complex ion. Does anybody remember the new cool name, I guess, for water in a complex ion? Aqua. Aqua. That's right. The Greek prefix for six is hex, or hexa. So this thing is hexa aqua cobalt two ion. So let's break this down. Hexa means six. Aqua, again, is the new name for water as a ligand, uh, i.e. a water surround connected to a metal. It's cobalt, Roman numeral two, because again, cobalt is a variable charge metal. The two is the uh, charge in Roman numeral. And again, it's an ion, it's not neutral. Like there's a positive charge or a negative charge, that's gonna make it an ion. If we had something else with it, maybe nitrates, then we would have a nitrate here. But it's an ion, it has a charge, so we're gonna call it something. Uh, questions on that? This thing is a compound we've seen before. It's an anti-cancer uh, drug called cisplatinum. But the real name of this thing, cis di -am I did that for double M's to highlight it. Sorry, not because I'm weird. Well, I am weird. Hey, prop that back on. Dichloroplatinum 2. All right, so let's, let's kind of break this down. So I made uh, fun a little bit there, I guess, of the M's because these are ammonias. And ammonia in this world is called an amine with two M's. And it's really, really important that you put the two M's there. So forget the cis for a second. Diamine, dichloro. Amine A comes before chloro C. So amine before chloro. And there's two of both of them, all right? So that's where the di comes in. It's a platinum center, so that's that part too. But notice here how ammonia is neutral and chlorine has a negative one charge. So since there's two of them and there's no net overall positive or negative charge, this has to be a platinum two center. So you can figure out the number here based on the number of chlorines. And then finally, because the two chlorines here are on the same side, they're not opposite each other, that's where the cis part comes in. In organic chemistry, we use cis to refer to pieces on the same side of the double bond, all right? What, do we, what would we call it, do you think, if the CLs were at 180 degree angles from each other? Trans, that's right. Cis and trans are things that will pop in once in a while. The cis version is a good anti-cancer drug, and apparently the trans one just sits there and doesn't do anything. Uh, one more example. This is actually a compound that you quote-unquote saw uh, in one of the labs. It's a complex ion with copper, all right? Now again, ammonia isn't called ammonium. It's this weird amine with two ends. Tetraamine would be the four of those. It's copper two from the charge right there. So this one would be tetraamine, copper two ion. 
Most of these will be octahedral, which means six pieces around them. But you can see these last two and stuff here were either tetrahedral and or square planar. And again, it has to do with the electrons around the metal. We may or may not talk about that part too much. Any questions? Yes, John. Why did we need The metal is always at the end. Good question. The metal is like the rock that these other guys are on, I guess. So the metal is always at the end. That's a really good question. So in all of these, Johnny, like cobalt will be at the end, or copper, or platinum, or iridium, or mercury, or whatever. Good call. Yeah, the reason we put the, ammon the ammonium before the chlorine is because it's alphabetical. Exactly, alphabetical. And so, and you want to use the A, mean, and stuff before the C. Yeah, good, good, good. The Greek prefixes don't count. Good questions. Other questions? Okay, this is a good place to stop. We're going to do more of this on Monday. But what I'm going to do now is shut this down and we'll talk about the midterm. in the first exam, all right, the grades are all, the grade percentages are all listed up there and stuff, and you can see for a 140 point midterm uh, what the different ranges are. Uh, in this class, the high was an amazing 139, wow, pretty freaking awesome. Several 138s, lots of people like 132 and stuff, I was very, very pleased. Um, very outstanding. Low, a little bit less than 139, that's all we have to say about that. The average was 109.0, and uh, this was amazingly a lot better than last year's Chem 223 class at this time. So I applaud you as a class and stuff, very well done. Uh, very, very exciting stuff. Um, when you get your exam back, all right, just like before, the front page will have the midterm. Don't even go there, all right? Don't even look at that. Go right to the last page, all right? And the last page is the summary sheet. And the score in the lower right-hand corner, that's your grade in the class as of right now, as far as I see it. And I totally encourage you to check this out, all right? Make sure that the grades I have are the grades I actually engrave you, because once in a while, as you can see, I'm kind of a space case when I start thinking about elementary particles or something. And anyway, I forget to, I forget to do it. So make sure that the grades are right. And also, if it says you're missing a midterm, or it, thanks for playing, if you're missing a lab, please turn it in, all right? If you turn in all the labs, even if they're late and stuff, you still get that lab completion bonus, and I definitely encourage you to do that. Um, the last day to turn stuff in for this class will be next week, Friday at 9 a.m., so get these things together. Um, if you get your midterm back and it wasn't really hot, don't worry. There is an extra credit assignment that you might qualify for, and within... <clears throat> An hour, hopefully, I will be sending out an email uh, about this about this possibility. So anyway, check your emails. Um, it will be on the website as an optional thing to do too. I encourage you to check that out. Um, this extra credit assignment will also be due though next Friday at 9 a.m. So just FYI on that. Any questions before I return these? Okay, without further ado then, if you are in Tuesday morning's lab, 
Here are your exams. Albert and Gary is my alphabetical. Tuesday afternoon, I will place right here. And if you're on Wednesday, I place them up here in the middle. Have a wonderful weekend.